You are watching The Jenny Lynn Show, and I am so glad to be back. I had taken a break. I have just set up a beautiful cosmetic clinic at Crossroads in Cupertino with my partner, and you guys should come down and check it out. But now it's done, beautiful and ready, and I am back to doing my shows, and I'm very happy to be back. Today, I have a very interesting guest. A lot of you might have seen him but because of the news that he was very popular in back in 2012. It was 2012, right? Yeah. And his name is William Lynch. And I'm sure if you were watching the news then and you're looking now, you will recognize him. William? Hi, thanks for having thank me. Thank you for coming on the Jenny Lynch Show. It's a pleasure to be here. It's been a long time coming. I've wanted to do this because um, for many reasons, which will come out during the interview. But you became famous when you sort of, based on all the stories, went to get revenge for what was done to you and your brother as children. You want to talk about that? Uh, sure. I mean, it wasn't really revenge. Okay. It was more, you know, a reckoning. Okay. Kind of retribution. And the thing that always motivated me was to prevent this from happening to another child. Right. And, um, you know, I tried everything that I could under the law to put this guy away, and there's nothing that could be done, and we can get into that more. But uh, finally, I went down and confronted him, and, you know, the story. Do you want to tell me about that? <laughs> Did you just walk over there? Was it easy to get to him? I mean, uh, well, I mean, I, I have to, I have to talk about the backstory, really. Okay. I mean, basically. Let's start where you want to start. Well, I mean, I can start at the beginning, really, with, okay. the, with the abuse. Yes. You know. Let's start with that. Um, I was on a camping trip. My brother and I were both abused by Father Joe Lindner. Um, it was particularly brutal. He absolutely, he raped me, he strangled me, he sodomized me, and more. And, you know, at one point I passed out or disassociated or whatever, but I wake up with his hands on my throat and he's furious and he's pushing me into the ground and he's saying, say it, say it. And I don't, I'm not really sure what he wanted me to say, but I remember in that moment feeling like, uh, like I was going to die and there's no way I was going to get out of this. And I think if he could have gotten away with it, he would have killed me. But there were too many people around and he said, if you ever tell anyone, I'll kill your family and I'll skin your sister alive while you watch and you're no longer a child of God and et cetera, et cetera. So basically at seven years old, I felt like I needed to protect my, my family and I never told anyone, mostly because I was absolutely convinced this guy would do what he said that he was going to do. Yeah, you're seven. Said anything. And um, so basically, you know, I had 20 years that I blocked this out. I just sort of flicked a switch in my mind and put it away. It just couldn't be talked about. And over the next 20 years, I basically suffered a lot. You know, I went into kind of a world of darkness and a lot of self-loathing and um, alcohol and drug, you know, abuse, um, problems with authority, missed authorities, broken relationships, missed opportunities, you know. And finally, this came out 20 years later. Um, you know, I actually thought that there you was You kept this secret for 20 years? You didn't tell anyone for 20 years? I didn't tell anyone for 20 years. And actually, it was my oh brother my that, that came forward. Excuse me. And, um, but, you know, during that time, it's, it's, it's like you're living with something that, that maybe I would equate to someone who's living with a certain sexuality they're trying to repress or something. You know, like, you can't be who you are. I just, yeah. I just thought I was crazy. And actually, I'd be walking around. I, I never viewed the rest of the world physiologically through my eyes, like I think that other people did. I just felt like I was, my brother described it like it was um, like being in a movie, you know, where you're, you're in a film, you're not really present, Character. but you're living in a film. You know, to me, it's like kind of being a ghost walking in a landscape and you're not really present. It's just, it's hard to describe, very disassociated. So, but when that all came out, um, the first thing I thought was, you know, we have to stop this guy from ever doing this to anyone else. And that was uh, a little bit of a difficult proposition at first. My brother didn't want to do anything. He was in a very bad state. We waited a little while, and then we did try to pursue justice. We had a civil suit. That came a little bit later. The first I wanted to do was put this guy in jail. And 
everywhere I went, they said, you can't, the statute of limitations expired for you when you were 13. So I was 27 when I came forward. So, I mean, there was, you know, they were long expired. So there's nothing that could be done. And I just could not accept that. I couldn't accept that this guy could do this to me and be doing it to other people and still be free to do it in the future. I went out, I found other victims, um, exposed them to a serial child molester, but they were all outside of the statutes of limitations. Jeez. And so that was really over that kind of a 15 year period. And eventually it came to a head. Um, you know, I'd worked hard to get my life on track, but suffered a lot. And I just woke up one day, I'm like, I'm gonna go down there, I'm gonna make this guy sign a confession <laughs> to what he's done, I'm gonna take him to the police station, and that's the way it's gonna be. But that's not the way it turned out. Okay, hold it right there. Yeah. When did you find out this was also happening to your brother? Uh, the same time on our camping trip. Oh, he did this to both of you at the same time? He, he did it to me individually, did it to my brother individually, and did it to both of us at the same time. What nerve? Yeah. Okay, so let's get back to when you got there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just woke up one day. It was, you know, there'd been many times I'd gone down there actually yeah. in different various states. Sometimes I was drunk, you know, sometimes I was extremely upset. Um, I just could never live with the fact that this guy was free to roam and do this to other children. And he's sitting up there in Los Gatos in the Sacred Heart Jesuit Retreat you know, by the vineyard overlooking the Silicon Valley um, with 18 institutions that have children from preschool to high school within one mile of him. Jeez. So, but I just woke up that day. Um, I was very calm, totally sober, totally mellow. I just said, you know, this is the day that I do this. And I went down there and... Uh, Did you tell anyone you were gonna go? I didn't tell anyone I was going. I know that they keep these guys under wraps. Um, down there, there's quite a few pedophiles and other wackos that they've got holed up in that place. Um, so I knew to get in there, um, I had to make a story. So I know his brother's a police officer, and I said, um, I'm a friend of Larry Lindner, police officer. Um, Larry Lindner's been killed in the line of duty, and I need to come and see Father Gerald Lindner and, and tell him the news, because I'm a close family friend. And I said, we'll probably need a private room for that, and you know, if you hear any commotion in there, just ignore it because it's just going to be an emotional you know, situation. Um, and so, and I got to tell you, I mean, going down there, I was, I was calm, but once I got there, I was scared to death. And I was sitting in this room waiting for him. And I, when he walked in, my, um, I couldn't do, I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. I, I started having body memories that relate to, um, the abuse? The abuse, you know, I mean, I, I felt like I was going to lose my bladder. I was shaking. I actually felt like I was imploding and I was becoming paralyzed, which really, really scared me. Did he recognize you? No, he didn't recognize me. And... Well, you were, what was the last time you saw him? I had seen him when we had our civil suit, which was back in 96. That mm -hmm. was the only time I'd seen him since the abuse. Okay. Um, once I was told there was nothing I could do criminally, somebody said you can bring a civil suit. It was never about the money. We didn't get much money. It didn't even cover anywhere near the expenses of what this has cost me. Right. Um, but we were able to put measures in place that would protect children. Like we wanted to know where he was at all times. We wanted him to be defrocked. We did not want him excommunicated and put on the street. We wanted him to, the church to still be responsible for him. It was things like that. But those things never really came to fruition. and. You know, he was supposed to be supervised and unable to roam around by himself, yet there was evidence of him roaming freely all the time. So, anyway, I'm back in that room with him, and um, I took everything I could do to get out of the chair. I felt like if I didn't move and get out of the chair, like, that he was just going to, I was afraid he was going to recognize me and he was going to back out. attack me. Oh. You know, it's just... Now, there's, a, there's this big conflict between the, your intellectual adult self and your emotional child mm -hmm. self. Because the molestation or the, the rape was it's like a frozen moment in time. So it's sort of with him, I, I never leave that. You know? and, and actually, when, it, when the incident happened, I mean, one of the things he was saying is, uh, you, know, you belong to me now. You're not like other children. You're no longer a child of God. And in a way, like I died that day and I was sort of reborn as, as Father Jerry's kid in a sick way. It's, this is so disturbing. Yeah. 
And I mean, for, you know, for decades, that guy tormented me in my dreams. I mean, I did not want to go to sleep because it's, because I couldn't control it, you know? And in my waking hours, I could, you know, I could control things the best that I could, but I, I hated to sleep. So you're in the room with him now, and he comes in, and you're kind of falling apart physically and emotionally because of yeah. all that. Well, I pulled it together because I felt like if I didn't get it together, something bad was going to happen to me, basically. And, you know, I walked over to him and I said, do you know who I am? And he's like, no. And I said, uh, I don't know what kind of language we can use on this, so. Go ahead. I just said, you should remember the kids that you fuck, motherfucker. And his body just slumped his body language and I'm like you're going to confess to what you did and we're going to take you down to the police station or the alternative what that would have been um, that could have gone all the way to the end could have gone to the ultimate you know the I'm ultimate glad end. it didn't happen that way I'm glad it didn't either um, but shortly after I said that to him he you know, he slumped in his body language, but then he just, he just came up again and he started leering at me the way he leered at me across the campground and, and like, you know, in a threatening way. <clears throat> and I just was, I just couldn't take that. And, uh, you're older and bigger a physical, and smarter. Well, now. yeah, a physical confrontation started to ensue. And I'm like, you know, I'm not seven anymore. And one thing led to another. And, um, the physical confrontation happened. And we came to a point where, I came to a point where my blood ran cold and, and I was completely calm. And I was more serene than I had ever been since this happened to me. And in that moment, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing because that was 35 years coming to a crystalline tip of, of a decision point. And in that moment, had we not been interrupted, I might have ended him. But somebody came through the door. And the irony is that um, when I got to the point where I could have done something like kill him, I was calm enough that I had the presence of mind when we were interrupted to choose not to become him in that moment and choose life for myself. And so, so I didn't take it any farther. Um, and basically, I left. And I just walked out of there, you know. I believe you were being protected. Yeah, I mean, it was divine intervention for mm -hmm. sure. Most for absolutely. Me. But it took me a year to realize that I had made a choice for, um, like that was an affirmation of my self-worth. Because I basically grew up feeling like my life was, my life ended that day. There was really no purpose for, for me living. Um, ironically, I thought I might serve serve this cause somehow, but it was, it was always going to involve me being like a martyr. I mean, if things had, if the worst had, had happened down there and I had taken him out, then I would have had the police take me out because I wasn't going to go to prison and, you know. Because it's like you were already living in a prison. Yeah, I've already done my time. I'm still doing it. I mean, I'm always going to have to deal with this, but, um, but going down there and confronting him, you know, it's, if you look at that face value, it's like I, I went and beat up an elder person. I beat up a priest. You know, it's not the right thing to do. But when you put it in context, it's what I had to do. And well, so it's a title. A priest is not someone who behaves that way. So obviously, yeah, well, priest is just a title in this case. Yeah, I mean, the reality is, though, it, you know, this isn't just a few bad apples in the church. I mean, there it's it's a culture of, of arrogance and ignorance that mm -hmm. that breeds these guys almost, mm -hmm. you know, and definitely protects them. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's a big, big problem, but it's not just there. It's, it's in every organization that engages our children. So Jeez. your private and public schools, your religious organizations, your social organizations, all of them. And all of these organizations are insured by the insurance companies who actually have a product for pedophilia protection. And I've noticed lately there's been a rise of suicide amongst kids, and sometimes I wonder how many of those children have been abused by someone or is living with the secret like the one you've had to carry and they've had no outlet or no recourse because they feel like if they seek out someone for advice, then their family will be in danger. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of people are threatened. Um, there's sort of a spectrum of offenders, you know, some are like, 
touch you and oh, this will be our little secret and others that are you know, a little bit more on the criminally insane side and, and make threats. But I think um, it's just a degrading experience. It's something that people don't want to come forward and talk about. When you bring religion into it, and then there's all the peripheral damage. You know, you have, your, this happens to you, then your family's affected. The way that you behave throughout your life affects other people in school. You're just maybe disrupting class or whatnot. Um, it's kind of hard to stay focused on... Um, how did you get through college? How did you graduate? How did you become this person who's sitting across from me, who seems so composed? Uh, Had I not seen you on well, TV, and if I didn't know who you were, I would never think that you've gone through any of this. Yeah, well, I've, I've had, I've absolutely been, you know, I've absolutely been completely unraveled. I mean, I've had very, you know, I had a period where it was really difficult for me to leave my house for the better part of a year. and. I'd be, you know, if, when it did go out, I'd be walking down the street, and if somebody made a sudden movement, like across the street, I'm jumping back like this, you know, and there's no one around me. Didn't there's your parents me. suspect something was going on? Uh, well, they knew something was going on, but nobody would, in, would ever have guessed this would have happened. I mean, back in the 70s, you know, this stuff was barely on the radar. People really just, it just wasn't in the social consciousness at all. You know, much less it happening at the hands of a priest. Right. <laughs> and I've talked to my parents about it. I mean, they're, they're like, this is just something that we, there's just absolutely no way that we ever could have expected this or prepared for this. And there's no, you know, there's no real process for getting through it. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do. There's some things that I've done that I can recommend that have helped me. But it's a difficult thing, you know. It's a difficult thing for a family to deal with. So you left there after you had your altercation with him, and did you have the composure to get in the car and drive home? What did you do? Uh, I walked out of there. I, you know, I, I'm like, I'm not running. I don't, you know, I just walked out, got in my car, <laughs> <laughs> drove away. Um, but I do remember when I was driving, I called my, uh, called my brother, told him what happened, and then I called my parents and told them what happened. And then I was, uh, I was an emotional roller coaster. I mean, I was laughing hysterically and with like total relief. And then I was bawling uncontrollably. And that just, you know, intermittently back and forth um, through that. It was definitely something that, uh, you know, it was, it was a release. But I also felt bad about it too. I mean, right. I, I felt empathy for Father Jerry. and. And I've come to terms with that now, but you know, back Good. back then, I really didn't. It bothered me that I felt empathy for him. Um, but I think you know, somewhere in the road of forgiveness, it begins with empathy. And I think where I try to apply that is really, you know, when it comes to ending the cycle of sexual abuse against children, there's really three main areas. And I think it's an advocacy to change the system that allows this to happen, and education and prevention and intervention. And then we have to do something for pedophiles. Oh, absolutely. All, I don't know what that is, though. It's a, it's a really difficult proposition. Because what, what is the system supposed to do with them, right? Someone was telling me that if you looked on the internet, you may be surprised how many of them live directly next door to you. Oh, yeah, they're everywhere. I mean, what are you supposed to do with these types of people, and how are we supposed to? It's very sad because every time you see a kid who goes to school with a gun and just goes trigger crazy, you wonder, is this someone who's been carrying a burden like you did? Obviously, you've come from a close family, and there was something protecting you along the way. Without a doubt. I mean, if it wasn't for my family, I would definitely be, um, someone would be dead. You know, if not me, somebody else, or I'd be in prison or, you know, something. I mean, you grow up feeling like you can't, especially as a, as a guy, you know, feeling like you can't take care of yourself. Um, protect yourself, you know, and then you kind of act out on that and um, put yourself and others in harm, you know, harm's way sometimes. I mean, just stupid fights when you're a kid or whatever, and you know, trying to prove something to yourself. And it's. Uh, if I ask you a question that you feel uncomfortable with, please neglect to answer it or tell me. I don't want to answer that. But no, I told you you has, can ask me anything. Okay, good. Yeah. So how, do, how has this affected your relationship with women, if it has? Um, after this happened, I had, I had a couple of 
past girls I dated call me up and say, you know, I'm really sorry for what happened, and this really answers a lot of questions. They're like, you know, you were always distant. It seemed like I could never connect with you, you know, just, you know, always saw like a good heart, but just couldn't really get inside and, and get a close connection. So, you know, it's definitely affected my relationships. It's, uh, you know, I lost a marriage because of it. I mean, basically, when this first came out, I was living with a, a woman and um, I told her, I said, you know what, this has happened and this is real. I have no idea how, I mean, I felt like at the beginning of this thing, I'm like, I have no idea how I'm ever gonna come through this. Like, you know, you can sit and look at something, some obstacle, some challenge in your life and, and sort of forecast something. I, I'm just like, I'm completely lost. I do know I have to do this in my own way, in my own time. and tried to break it off, you know, but she's like, I love you, I want to support you, and I loved her, and we stayed together, but it was just too much for us to handle, you know. I had a lot of downtime where I couldn't work, and I was dealing with depression, and, you know, abusing alcohol and drugs at various times, and um, it's not really about those, any particular thing, it's, it's about escapism. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I've watched, like, every movie known to man, you know, any way that I could get out of my head and just not have to be present with myself, you know, and today, I mean, I'm present with myself all the time, and I've done a lot awesome. of work to get where I am yeah. and do what I'm doing. But back in those days, it was just, uh, it was just unbearable to be in my head, to be with myself. How long after this experience did were you able to get help for the first time? Because if you hadn't told anyone, obviously, it was a burden and a secret that you were carrying. So if no one knows you're not old enough or smart enough at this age to know where to go to get help. How long after this happened to you were you living with it before you were able to get some kind of intervention? Uh, well, we had, you know, the family had done some counseling and I had done some counseling before this came out because something was wrong. Like, we, we just, nobody could figure it out. And, and after I found out it, it was a, a little bit of relief for everyone because we were it answered a lot of questions and, yeah. and took away some of that pressure, but then you're still left with the reality of how are we going to get through this. You know, I did some counseling, um, tried a few different things, and like a lot of different things along the way, but there was something in the way of my, personally, my personal recovery, and that was confronting him. And I knew, if, I was afraid that if I ever confronted him that I would kill him. And I was afraid I'd kill him because I was so scared of him that things would just get out of hand and, and, and something bad would happen. But it really, it was my destiny to confront him. And, but, you know, different people deal with it different ways. Yeah. Some people internalize it. Some people, we all internalize it. But some people also externalize it. You know, they want to act out. And I know that the way, the path that I've chosen for dealing with this as far as confronting him and the way that that went was not something that most people would do in my position and also many people aren't comfortable with it. Do you have any children of your own? No. That was one thing in, in my marriage was a point of contention because I absolutely would not have kids until I was figured out how to, you know, kind of fix this situation. Didn't want to bring a kid into a situation. I want to break the cycle, um, you know, of this, of this violence really is what it comes down to. I, I, I wouldn't want to be affected by it so that my judgment was affected in how I, you know, treated my children or how I raised them or whatnot, so. Are you feeling at peace with this now? I mean, of course, it will always leave an indelible mark, but have you unloaded the animosity, the hurt, the pain? Are you at peace with, this has happened, and I draw the line here. I'm not giving the rest of my life to this anymore. Are you at that place yet? Uh, yeah, I am, I am at a place, I mean, I, this is something that's, it's always going to be with me, and it's changed who I am. I remember a long time ago, somebody said, you know, may, you know, someday maybe you'll see this as a gift. And I literally, like, put that person up against the wall, you know, I was, I was not having, a, I wasn't in a good space those days, and like, you know, kind of shaking him. You think it's a gift? You know, like, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. But now that I've gone down and kind of, it was my destiny to confront him, I really kind of exercised a lot of the rage that I had into him, and mm -hmm. it's given me, um, you know, I found my voice and became empowered and started to take back my life in a way that I never could before. So in that way, um, it's sort of behind me. But 
for now and the foreseeable future, I've dedicated my life to trying to transform this issue because I started to look at it and you know, I realized, uh, why doesn't anything get done? You know, there, there are solutions here. Why doesn't anyone do it? Because it's controversial and people don't want to deal with it? It's and controversial and people don't want to deal with it. And mm -hmm. what people need to understand is that this is a silent pandemic that's mm -hmm. escalating worldwide. Exactly. You know, 90% of these cases go unreported. I mean, I, I'm not a big stats guy, but there's a lot of people out there who've been affected by this who don't have a reason to come forward. Exactly. And well, and also we don't understand that the children are our future. And whatever we cultivate now is what, if we're still around, or we're going to live with in the future. So why not cultivate a healthy generation and people who are ill take care of them so they don't go around contaminating other people's lives. Mm -hmm. Everybody deserves to have the life that God has put them on this earth for. And why should some sick person determine your outcome by doing what's been done to you and what's being done to children all the time? Yeah, and that's, that's a good way you put it because it, it is a determination of your outcome. Mm -hmm. You really lose yourself and you know when you're especially when you're that young i mean you're still developing and i've tried to explain to people before there's something that we're all tethered to you know this sense of self that we're all tethered to that you lose when that happens to you and you just you know you're like a broken satellite spinning out into space you know out of orbit like you don't know where you're going but you're kind of going nowhere fast you know and it's it's a very um it's a very difficult situation to navigate and that's this is why I formed RISE, Roots for Individual and Social Empowerment. And that's a nonprofit advocacy. And we're dedicated to ending the cycle of sexual abuse against children. And I want people to get what I got, which is finding their voice, becoming empowered, and taking their life back, but in a way that's safe and productive. Um, you know, we didn't really talk about the trial yet, but the outcome that, that happened for me was not typical at all. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to end this segment by telling you that I really admire you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, that. Meeting you is really a big gift to me, and I'm sure people that are watching this. So we're going to cut here, and then we're going to continue the second half of this interview talking about your trial okay. and about your organization and how people watching this can, can contact you to help other situations like this Great. or help kids in general. Great. Do you want to say goodbye to the audience? Bye. <laughs>